Uh, before we start, let's just go in a word of prayer, and then uh, we can begin. So let's let's pray. Uh, God, thank you just for this time that we can just gather here today, God, to start the week right, God, and just worshiping you um, as a community. I pray, Father, that you'll speak to us through your word today. That, God, out of my brokenness, I'm just fully relying on you. I pray, Father, that we have an encounter with you, an experience with you in our minds and in our hearts, that we leave this place transformed or with a thought or, or a word from you, to, from you today, God. Lord, we thank you for everything, and we lift this day to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, if you know me, uh, I, hate, I hate running. I hate running long distance runs. Every time I feel an ounce of pain or stress, I quit. I can't do it. I'm not a very good runner. Even if I walk. You know, if, if you ever look at my Instagram videos or Instagram stories, and then you see me walking with my family, the reason why they're walking ahead of me is because they're too fast for me. Like, I, I'm not, I cannot keep up with that. Like, I feel I need to be at a laid back pace. So it may come shocking to you or to everyone when I joined the cross-country team in grade 8. So there I am, over there, if you can see me, I'm there, ready to run. So grade 8, man, that was a great year. I made every single team, basketball, volleyball, badminton. Um, and so I, I made the team, and practices were death. They were uh, death for me. We had this final meet. It was city finals, and there are tons of kids, like 300 kids, ready to run. So we line up at the start line. And I don't know if you ever watched the movie Braveheart, but it was like they all lined up, and when the gun shot off, everyone ran. It was like, ah, oh, it was running. People were falling. I was jumping over people, and we were running. And it looked like an army starting to fight. And literally two minutes into the race, I started feeling stress on my legs, stress on my feet. I already wanted to quit. I was done. I was like, oh gosh, this hurts. So I'm feeling all this stress in my body, but there was something inside of me that was saying, keep going, keep going, push through, power through. And I kept thinking to myself, this is the last race. And literally, it was the last race of my whole life. Like, I never ran a race ever again. But I, I, I ran. I was like, okay, this is my last race. My whole body hurt. I was in pain. And it was hard. There was this temptation. This temptation. Okay, just quit. You know, just walk. It's okay. You're not going to win. Just, just walk. But I felt like I was getting stronger as I kept going, like running and, you know, and just like, oh, I'm feeling the pain. I'm like, you know what, just keep going. And I start noticing that I'm starting to pass other people, people that were in front of me. I was starting to pass them and I'd look at them and be like, ah. And then there were people that were ahead of me that, you know, they started to walk. I was like, ha, 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 and I kept going and running. And a few minutes later, I see the finish line. I see it right ahead. And for some reason, that, like, motivated me to go faster, to keep going. Power through. So I'm running, and I'm passing these people, and I cannot believe it. And I'm ecstatic. I cross the finish line, and I look at where I place. I'm like, oh, my God. 
I finished a whopping 90 seconds out of 300. That, that's pretty good, right? Right? Thank you. I did it! <laughs> 90 seconds. Thanks for clapping, Ray. No one claps for the 90 second person, but. But I didn't quit. And it was hard. It was painful. And I, I was proud of myself. Because that was the first and only race that I've never that I've run that I've never stopped. That was like the only one, even to this day. So grade eight, what was that? That was 1998. Oh man. That was a long time ago. But I was proud. Proud of myself. You know, many times a lot of pastors or Christians, they use the race as a metaphor to describe the Christian life. That the Christian life is hard, it is painful, that our walk with God will have struggles, it will have pain, there's this struggle with sin, there's this struggle with temptation. It can be really frustrating that a lot of us just want to quit. Some of us here today, you woke up and you didn't want to come here. There's a part of you that's like, ah, oh, you know, this, it's too hard. And you want to quit. This week we are starting a new sermon series in 1 Peter. This book was written to people who were going through a lot of trials. They're going through a lot of hard times. Their surrounding culture was mistreating them because they were Christians. They were wrestling with the personal cost, the personal cost of following Jesus. And many of them probably, probably wanted to quit. So Paul, uh, Peter writes this letter to encourage the church. And he implores them to keep going, to keep running despite the trials, to remember who you are. So if you want to open your Bibles, let's read the first chapter of Peter. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. We're just going to focus on two verses. There's, there's so much meat in these two verses. It doesn't seem like it when you read it. You're like, it looks like a greeting. But there's so much meat here. Meat on the bone. So let's read it. It was like this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, to the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. So my question today is this. Why should we, why should Christians pay the price to follow Jesus? Why should we keep following when it's hard? Our Bible passage exclaim, explain, explores two keys. That one, God's plan is better than our plan. And two, the only way to follow God's plan is to pay the price. One of my favorite cartoons growing up was He-Man. I had all the toys. And what's cool is Netflix has started a new cartoon on, with He-Man. I'm like, oh, yeah, they, they recreated it. So I, I need to watch it. So the main character is Prince Adam. Oh my gosh, look at him. He works out. Um, he's Prince Adam, and he's the youngest son of Eternia's rulers, King Randor and Queen Marlena. But Prince Adam has a secret. He has a secret. You know, behind that tight shirt, he carries a sword. You can't tell, but he has a sword in his back. So whenever he holds the sword of power, 
He puts it to the sky and he shouts, he shouts this line. He says, by the power of Grayskull. And then these lightning bolts come and they're like, ah. And all of a sudden, like, his, his, his clothes like rip off and he becomes He-Man, this powerful warrior. And he fights this guy, this villain named Skeletor. He's like this skeleton, but he's like muscular too. And Skeletor wants to conquer all of Eternia. And every episode, every single one, Adam does the same thing over and over. When he sees evil, he, just, he takes out his sword, bad power, great soul, boom, turns into He-Man, and then he fights. That's whose that's who's identity. This is who he is. He is a warrior defending Eternia from evil. There are no episodes. There are no episodes where Adam grabs his sword, puts it into the air, and then turns into a doctor. Never. There's no, there's no episode where, ah, power grace call, then he becomes like this air pilot. Never. Ever. Every single time he puts a sword of power into the sky, he becomes a warrior. Because that's who he is. The creator of the show, he purposely planned Adam's life to defend Eternia from Skeletor, the evil forces. That is his story. It's the same thing with Christians. This passage that we read, it shares to us that we have an identity. That God has a plan and mission for our lives based on that identity. The identity that he has given us. So when the first Christians were going through hard times, they're going through trials, Peter wrote to them to remind them. He doesn't, Peter doesn't go there and go, oh, you know, let's make everything comfortable. No, he reminds them about who they are in Christ. He reminds them of their identity. So let's read it again. It says this, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father to the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus. There's some big words there, like those fancy words that you use at Bible college that we don't ever use up on stage. But let's, let's unpack it, okay? Let's unpack some of these big words because they tell us a lot about who we are as Christians. So the word elect, so I highlighted it there. Yellow, elect, okay? The word elect in our passage means chosen by God. Chosen by God. We didn't do anything to earn it. We didn't do anything to get this status. But God has chosen to commit to us. The word exiles, highlighted in blue, means we aren't in our homeland. We are citizens of another place. We are citizens of heaven. We follow and represent Jesus wherever we go. We represent Jesus to this world. So yes, it can be very uncomfortable because many times Jesus' ways are at odds with the culture. So you should feel some level of tension. For knowledge, highlighted in black, I don't know if you can see it there, but it means that God knew us beforehand. Before even the world was created, he chose us that these moments that we are living, God has been planning since eternity's past. My favorite part here is Peter uses the words Father, Spirit, and Son that God loves us with his whole self. He doesn't partly love us. He loves all of us, his whole self, that we have God's whole commitment. 
his commitment committed to us. These words are important because they tell our story. It tells us who we are. As Christians, we are chosen by God, and our home is ultimately with Him. When we face constant trials, pain, it is a reminder that we are not fully home yet, that something better is coming, something whole is coming, and there's still work to do here. Furthering the kingdom... So we need to keep following him until Jesus comes back and completes it all. This is a story that we need to live by. It's a story that should shape our worldview. But so often, many of us forget our story. We forget who we truly are. We go to a party, we forget. We go to work, we forget. We go to school. We forget. Or worse, we start to adopt a secular story for our lives where our views are no longer Christian. We need good habits that constantly remind us of who we are. You know, Kobe Bryant was a... Uh, was a crazy competitor. That's not Kobe Bryant, but <laughs> maybe under that mask, ha. Huh? Okay, but uh, Kobe Bryant was, was a crazy competitor. He had this mentality that every time he's on the basketball court, he is a killer. You're like, whoa, killer? Gosh, that's a little bit too much. But that's how he thought, that he had this killer instinct. So before important games, he would like become like Michael Myers from Halloween. I don't know if you ever watched the movie Halloween, but this is what Kobe Bryant would do. He would play on repeat the popular theme song from the movie Halloween. You know that song, and he would just sit there. Like every game, and he would just be getting in that zone. You know, and then he's just like, oh, this is it. We're going to the court, I'm gonna kill you guys. I don't know what I would do. Oh, well, Chris Tomlin's song. No, I, I, I don't know, but that's what hyped him up. That song to remind him of what he's supposed to do, of who he is. You know, as Christians, we need to have these habits and daily reminders of who we are. We forget way too easily. We need to have that gospel truth repeated on repeat in our minds. The truth that we are God's chosen people. We are supposed to represent Him and His ways. That our home is with Him. So that we continue to persevere, continue to do the work, loving God and loving people. You know, we need to repeat that story that we aren't necessarily here to be comfortable. And it feels like that's the story that we try to like, repeat our minds. Oh, I just need to be comfortable. This is really hard, because I feel the same way too. I love being comfortable. Because our, it's hard because our whole, we're whole naturally want to be comfortable. You know, we have whole industries that create markets and products that appeal to our comfort. For many of us, that is what we live for. But is comfort the ultimate answer? You know, we know that comfort isn't the ultimate answer. I know we see this from the Bible, but we're starting to see this from the social sciences. You know, uh, psychiatrist Madeline Levine, in her book, The Price of Privilege, she writes this, America's newly identified at-risk group is pre-teens and teens from affluent well-educated families. In spite of their economic and social advantages, children of afflu affluence experience among the highest rates of depression, substance abuse, anxiety disorders, somatic complaints, and unhappiness. 
of any group of children in this country. It's starting to hit adults too. Uh, Greg Easterbrook in his book, you know, his title is so interesting. He says, The Progress Paradox, How Life Gets Better While People Feel Worse. Isn't, isn't that interesting? And he says this, 10 times as many people in Western nations today suffer from unipo unipolar depression or unremitting bad feelings without a specific cause. They did half a century ago. And he said, this is the key part, he says, Americans and Europeans have ever more of everything. They have ever more of everything. All the comforts, the riches that you can find. They have everything except happiness. How could this be? How can the most comfortable, the most wealthy, yet so unhappy? Because comfort can only go so far. It cannot truly, completely satisfy us. We're starting to see evidence of that that we will always be looking for more. But the only thing that can truly satisfy us is Jesus. And everyone has to come to that reckoning, that confrontation, when you have all these things, and it's not satisfying you, but then there's Jesus. Is Jesus the living water? Is he the bread of life as he claims to be? And what can truly only satisfy us is Jesus is living in his plan. That God has a plan that is better than ours. Yes, God's plan will have mountaintops. God's plan will have valleys. But it's always for our good. And the pain and the sacrifice will always be worth it. And this will lead to my next point. That the only way to follow God's plan is to pay the price. Dur during the pandemic, I shared that I had a kidney stone. And I know I shared this before. I shared it one of my other servants. But I wasn't comfortable sharing the details. But today, I feel free to... So I, I had a kidney stone, and I was in a lot of pain. And I had to take, a lot, I had to get a lot of tests done, like a CT scan, an X-ray, was it so, ultrasound. So I didn't have a baby, but it was on my back. And yeah, I got a lot of tests done. And so they're trying to figure out what I had. And I get, a lot, I get a letter from the doctor. And I was like, oh, wow. So I open it. And in the letter is his plan. He says, I have a kidney stone. It's confirmed. And what we're going to do is we're going to get a, we're going to do a cystoscopy. And then probably do a ureteroscopy. And I was like, yes. Those are fancy words. That sounds cool. A ureta roscopy. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, let's get this sucker out. Let's do it. But then I realized I actually did not know what a ureta roscopy is. So I Googled it. You can Google it if you want. I'm not ashamed. If you want, you can Google it right now. Ureter Roscopy. I don't even know if I'm saying it. All right, but anyways, I Google it. The results come up. I almost fainted. I could not believe my eyes. I, I was in disbelief. I, this is impossible. And I was like, oh my gosh, this cannot be the plan. This can't be the plan. This is not what we're supposed to be. We can't be doing something like this. The doctor calls me. 
So I'm asking a lot of questions. He's trying to tell me his plan. The worst part of it wasn't the procedure, but how enthusiastic he was. And so nonchalant. It was like we were planning a picnic. Like, I was like, what? He's like, we got to zigzag our way up there. I'm like, huh? Huh? How can you say? How can you say that? I go to the hospital. It's a day surgery. I, I get the surgery done. I wake up, and there, there was this feeling of relief. It's over. I'm alive. Yes, it's finally done. The nurse comes and she has, I don't know, if she, she has her like discharge papers and she has to give you like, um, you know, kind of like what you have to do to recover. And then she pauses. And she looks, and she looks twice. And I'm like, oh gosh, what is wrong? He's like, oh, it, it, it looks like you have to come back. We didn't get it all out. You'll have to do a second procedure, a second surgery. What? Are you serious? No, no, no. This can't be the plan. This is a horrible plan. I was getting mad at doctor. I'm like, Dr. Metcalf, you're right. And I was getting so upset. This is the worst plan ever. I was starting to get bitter. It's supposed to be over. But I have to do it again? So the second time comes around. This time I have to stay overnight. Overnight at the hospital. It was so uncomfortable. The surgery happened. I was finished. But I was in so much pain. I was suffering. Like I've never suffered before because I was following this doctor's plan. But in hindsight, was it worth it? It's been almost a year. January 5th, that's the date. Was it worth it? You know, in hindsight, when you get to look back, is it worth it? Was the doctor's plan worth it? Worth the suffering, worth the pain? I'd have to say yes. Because, oh, look at here. I, I, I don't feel paid in my back. I can sleep. You know, it's weird when you can't sleep. There was that one day I couldn't sleep. I was actually dreaming of pain. And then I woke up, oh gosh, it's actually real. Like, it was the worst. Even though I did not like it, the surgery worked because oh yeah, I obeyed what the doctor was saying. Did it suck at times? Yes. Was I frustrated? Yes. Did I have questions? Yes. Was I complaining? Yes. It's the same thing with God. He's like this doctor who has a plan for our lives. And it can be frustrating. You'll have questions. You're in this stage of life and you don't like it. But we have to obey him. We have to trust him. And we trust that his good plan will work. It's the only way. The only way is to obey him or else his plan won't work. Look at verse 2 again. It says, We have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctified work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Be obedient that our identity, who we are, is to obey, is to trust Jesus' plan for our lives, even when we don't understand. To pay whatever price, because that's the only way to follow his plan, and in the end, it will be worth it. You know, many times people are like, oh, is God's plan just keeping the rules? No. It's not just about keeping rules. It's about loving God. Loving God and loving your neighbor at every stage of God's plan for your life. 
It's giving your all to God, your time, your comfort, your energy to God at every stage of life, at every stage of the plan. You know, it's like when you're single, you know, you're in God's plan, and you're, it's, the time is to be single, it's to love God, to love other people in that stage. Or maybe God has you at a specific workplace right now. It's to love people, love God in that space, impacting the lives of people there. That is who we are. Maybe you're married, maybe you have kids. It's loving your family well. God's plan will challenge every Christian. It will. You know, one thing I find challenging about God's plan, you know, is, is evangelism. It's like, come on, have those conversations about me. Do I have to? You know, I should have it, but sometimes I'm scared. Sometimes I get nervous. So there are some things I do I'm like, I, to combat the fear and nerves. I've decided to work hard at knowing what I believe, but why I believe it. It's been helpful for the conversations I've had, the confidence for myself. Is it still scary? Yes. Of course. But it's worth it. It's worth the fear. It's worth the sacrifice for potentially someone meeting Jesus, someone being with God forever. Following Jesus is never going to be easy. It's never going to be perfect. But we got to keep going. Keep going. Problems occur when we stop trying. When you decide... This is not worth it anymore. That's why we get in trouble. So we've got to commit ourselves to following his plan. Let's live this out on mission. And when we mess up, let's just get back up. Get back up. Keep going because it's worth it. So as Christians, we have an identity. We are exiles Citizens of heaven, we follow and represent Jesus wherever we go. This is who we are. God has a plan for us, but some of us have forgotten our identity. Maybe your identity, you find it at church, but then you go to work somewhere else, and we forget. We need to get back to who we are, get back on God's plan for our lives. To, re- to represent himself, to represent Jesus well. I know some of us here are afraid of the cost, the sacrifice to following God. But God's plan is worth the sacrifice in the end. So let's commit, let's keep trying. The moment we stop trying is when we are in trouble. So let's continue to persevere. Let's continue to fight because there is no safer place that to be in God's will, that to be in God's plan. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to remind us of who we are, Continue to remind us of our identity. Help us to not forget. God, I pray that we continue to develop habits, daily reminders of who we are and what we're supposed to do, what kind of mission that we are on. Father, there are some of us here that are really struggling with your plan right now. Struggling at a stage of life where we, we have so many questions. Some of us are mad, or some of us are bitter. Some of us are confused. Father, I thank you that you allow us to lament, to cry out to you, to share how we truly feel, 
that it's safe to do so, that it is part of intimacy with you, God, that we can share how we truly feel. So I pray, Father, that if that's how we're feeling today, that we have this intimate time of prayer with you where we're just crying out. God, help us to continue to make the necessary sacrifices, whether that's paid or whether that's fear, to follow your plan. God, it's the only way. Help us to realize that comfort isn't all that it's cut out, cut out to be. God, we thank you so much for everything. Continue to work in us. In your name we pray. Amen.